Um, Luke chapter 2. That's where we want to get to. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, there is a, there's a statement there that just caught my attention that I want to share with you. And you got to let me share the entire sermon this morning with you so you can make sense of it. Because if I make one statement, it might be taken out of context. Um, there's this point that God talks about the favor of the Lord. And I think what happens in life is that we consider this. We get born again salvation. We, we accept Jesus Christ into our heart. And then we're given eternity. We're given heaven. And then we say, we read often in scriptures, we say, okay, salvation. I can't work out my salvation. It's not about works. I can't work my way into heaven. We get that. So we just stop there usually, though. We say, get saved, and you're going to get to heaven. And then we have to live here for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, however long that is. But we don't teach on that part very often. We just kind of say, you've got to get saved, and you're going to go to heaven. And then we just leave it empty. We say, okay, good luck, see you next Sunday. <laughs> Right? But I think there's something that we, there's a biblical principle that's a lane for us to live by, and that there is the favor and the blessing of God upon it. And so again, understand the difference though. It's not about like, if I do these things, that it would change my eternal destination, or God would love me more. You've got to hear that clearly. It's not about when I say, hey, as we gain the favor of the Lord, it's, here's some some requirements. It's not about, again, like, oh, God will love me more if I do that. When I open this thing up, God will love me more. When I come here more often, God will love me more. Um, when I give to him, he'll love me more. No, 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 no. That's false doctrine. That's not what I'm talking about. God loves you. It's his character. He can't stop loving you. You turn his back on you, he loves you. You can spit on him and curse him, and he loves you in Jesus' name. That's the kind of God that we serve. But as we go through that, as we live this life out, there are blessings. And we can enjoy the favor of the Lord. And so let me just stay in that lane for a moment. So we look into Luke here. I love this. Oh, the Bible, but I really like Luke right now for whatever reason. I'm having some fun in there. Uh, Luke chapter 1, we start with, and I've said this quite often. I think it's important to recap it sometimes. We see Luke chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, a chronological order of Christ's life. And so we would see it clearly here. I'm just going to do just a couple bullet points here. You can see some subheadings in your Bible with the same terminology. So we see the birth of Christ. We're getting close to that. Uh, the shepherds and the angels show up and just, you know, announce the birth of Christ. We see Jesus as a young little whippersnapper presented in the temple courts. Uh, we see Jesus as a preteen there. And then we get to this statement here. Jesus gets baptized, he goes into full-time ministry, and it says this just before he does it. Just before he's baptized, just before he goes into full-time ministry, it says this in verse 52. A lot of verses in Luke chapter 2. It's the very last verse in chapter 2. And Jesus grew in wisdom, he grew in stature, and he grew in the favor with God and with men. And I just thought, wow. We say to ourselves often, we say, you know, be Christ-like, be Jesus-like. So grow in stature. Well, at some point, you know, that kind of, you know, kind of stunt that kind of stops. But grow in wisdom. Grow in the favor of God and the favor of men. Like, there's a bit of a list there. You know, interesting. Eh? Grow in the favor of the Lord. I mean, Jesus is the Son of God. I don't know how you grow in favor with God himself. But as Jesus was baptized... He did it. He didn't need to do it. He didn't have any sin on him. But it's an example. It's a direction that we should be following. So we see this. Should we grow in the favor of the Lord? And we see in the Bible, I think, okay, well, how many times is in there? Let's see some stories. There's 150 stories in there. That's a lot. So again, I'm not referring to the fact about salvation, about more love for you. It's about the idea of Growing in the favor of the Lord. And I want to show you some scriptures so they will support me on this one. If we go back to the Old Testament, I'm going to move around quite a bit here. I apologize. Uh, if you're taking notes, you better take them real quick here. But 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. 
it says this. It says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So if we're fully committed to the Lord, the Lord looks down, and I would sense this. I mean, last night in the concert, there was a few songs. It was a beautiful concert. There was a few songs that just my, whoa. I just felt like, whoa, God's moving. The presence of the Lord is here. I would say in our service, there was a certain song we sung this morning. I think it was the second song we sung this morning. I just felt like, whoa, God's moving. I mean, he's always moving, but he's looking. You see, you read that, it says he's going about in his range, trying to find who are fully committed to him so that he can strengthen them. Then we see the opposing camp. We love the Jesus camp, but there's also like the enemy's camp. And we'd read about him as well in the same capacity. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be, caref- be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, God's looking around at people to bless. And the devil's looking around at people to curse and destroy and to kill. And so there's two camps here. And so I know that for a lot of my first years of life, I was allowing that old devil to kind of just, you know, come upon me and, and, you know, say things and just speak over my life. And then I got saved. And then I got, you know, into a relationship with Jesus. And then God looked down at me and says, oh, yeah, he doesn't love me any differently, but he's looking at blessing me. He's looking at giving me the favor of the Lord as I pursue him. You see that? He's looking to see whose hearts are fully committed to them. Not whose hearts are fully committed to myself, but fully committed to him and to no one else or to to no one other than him. So if our intentions have any, if any part of our lives are out of alignment with that, God is saying, I want to bless you in that area. Would you commit that to me? And as I look around the earth and I see you, I will pour favor out upon you for those that seek me. So how do we seek the Lord? Here's some examples. We go back to Jeremiah. Great story. Everybody knows this uh, scripture. Uh, it's on probably your Bible. It might be on the front. It might be on, a, on a, something you own. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. And so how do we seek the Lord? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Keep reading on, though. Don't just land there. You've got to read the whole context of this thing. Verse 12. Then you will call upon me. Oh. Oh. God has a plan for me. He wants to prosper me. He wants to give me a future. But my job is I call upon him. And I come and pray to him. And he will listen to me. Verse 13. You will seek me, you'll find me, and you seek me with all of your heart. Do you see that, though? Verse 11, we all land there. We want that. I, you know, well, give me prosper. Prosperity gospel, Lord. Don't, don't cause any harm to me, Lord. I don't like any of that business. Oh, give me a hope, Lord. I need some hope. Uh, give me a future, Lord. It's got to look better than today. And, and then we don't read past that, though. When God is saying, you know, call upon me. As the Lord's looking out there, he's looking. And I love how the devil's out there just trying to like, he's going to just push himself on you. And the Lord is looking patiently and quietly and just wants to come and meet with you. He's not pushy. And when we seek him, I like it. It's not like, you really got to find him. Actually, if you go here to this place, you'll find him. Or if you do this, you'll find him. As you just seek him, he's already right there. And you'll find him. He's not hard to find. He's very easy to find. Have you ever done that? You're in a really dark place in your life or you've gone through something really difficult and you're like, fine, I will pray or I will open the scriptures. And as soon as you do that, boom, all the peace and the joy and the blessing comes again. You're like, why was I so foolish, you know, not coming here sooner? Do you see that? It's true. You know that. You're laughing with me because you know it's true. Sometimes even you don't come to church sometimes. I'm super guilty of that. Not anymore because I'm the pastor. I need to come to church every Sunday. But way back in the day, you know, a lot of years ago, there would be, I would do something that week, and I'm like, I don't want to go to church. Or it was Saturday night. I was like, I don't, I don't really want to do that. And I remember when I came, though, is I just walked in the building. I just crying like a baby because all of a sudden I felt, oh, oh, that yoke of heaviness has been lifted in Jesus' name. 
Because God sees you. He sees your actions. He sees your attitude. He sees your heart. I'm going to bless that guy. I'm going to give him the favor of the Lord upon that guy. Because he's pursuing me. It's not, again, it's not favoritism. You're God's favorite. He loves you. And he wants to bless you. And so when we pursue him, there's just, it's a little bit different, right? And understand the context, again, of that whole passage right there. Let's go back just a couple verses. Verse 10 of Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I, see, God's going to do it. The Lord's going to do it. I'll come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Thank you, Jesus. Because the people of God at that time, for more than 70 years, for 490 years, basically, forget God. I need God. Generations of people just said, we don't need the Lord. We're in the milk and honey land. What do I need, God? I live in North America. What do I need anything? I live in Terrace, B.C. It is so good. What do I need the Lord for? And so they had turned their backs on the Lord, and their, God had placed them in Babylon for a season, and then God says, I'm going to come and rescue them. And so often we think that, you know, oh, I've come to the Lord, and the Lord has accepted me, and that's all we've done or something. And it's all the Lord's doing. It's all the Lord's timing. You haven't really done anything. You got dressed this morning, you came to church, praise God. But outside of that, it's the Lord guiding you every step of the way. And even when bad things are happy, you say, oh, Lord, you're out, you know, give me the wheel, Lord. You're, you don't even know what you're doing over here. And the Lord's like, you know, get in the back. No, don't even get in the back. So just get out. You know, like, I'm joking. But the Lord is totally, you haven't come to Terrace because you chose to. You weren't born in Terrace or you didn't move here. Or all that kind of stuff. The Lord has guided you, even here this morning, to hear a message like this. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't that just wonderful to think about? Because if we're in control, I'm actually a pretty good driver. I had a, a Camaro 350 when I was a kid. Man, I could turn corners at like, eh, you know. I have, you know, I wasn't like a video game where, you, oh, you make the mistake and you're done. You know, it was like, you needed to know what you were doing. And so I had lots of fun driving around. Then I realized, like, I, I'm a poor driver of my life, though. I don't want to be behind the wheel. I need the Lord to drive my life. And so I gladly give it to him. I freely give it to him because he is a way better driver than I am. Amen? Amen. Uh, we usually favor people who favor us, don't we? In the same way God shows favor to, favors to the ones that, he's, uh, that delight in him, sorry, uh, connect with him and give him honor. Again, it's not about you know, love. Understand that God loves you. It's not about more or you know, you're going to work this out. Don't get confused with that. But listen to what it says in Isaiah 66 too. Has not my hand, the hand of the Lord, the hand of God, made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one I esteem, or we could say this is the one that I favor. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles. Wasn't that just a great trembles? at the Word. I hope as you come to the Word of God for yourself personally throughout the weeks and the days when we don't meet together, that you come here with reverence and awe. And you picture this in the spiritual realm. I love visualizing things. So when you open that, it's like the heavens are opened. And God looks down at you and goes, I want to meet with my son or my daughter. I want to speak into their lives. I want to guide them. I want to help them. I want to just do all those things for them. And so again, it's not favoritism, but God goes, oh, I'm going to meet you there. As we tremble at his word. Don't ever downplay this thing. You can come here as broken as you want, as sinful as you want. And when you open that thing, it's like a new day. It's a new moment. The old is gone and the new has just begun. Isn't that just wonderful to think about? As easy and quickly as that is. But we don't get that in this world because typically when we do something wrong, we think, oh, there's a whole process. There's a whole, like, we've got to work it out now. now we, we, we've lost the trust of the Lord. We've got to, you know, it's going to take a season. You know, this might take a time of recover. There might be some, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's worldly thinking in the spiritual realm. As soon as you put your eyes, as soon as you get on your knees, as soon as you open the word, as soon as you, you know, turn from your wicked way, pow, 
in the spiritual realm. God will meet you there. The Holy Spirit will meet you there. And so we see the favor upon the Lord of many different people scripturally. Let's look at this. Just a couple snapshots here. Noah. Well, that's a, that's a tough story. <laughs> Genesis 6, 8. But Noah and his family found favor in the eyes of the Lord. We know that nobody else at that point was finding favor. We move on a little bit to Moses. Uh, Exodus thirty three thirteen. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so that I may know and continue to find favor with you. So it's almost like he didn't have it, and when he found it, he said, oh, I, I want to continue in that. I don't want to lose it again. Then we see Mary in the New Testament. We're in Luke as well already. We're still there. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are amazing. Beautiful? No. Highly favored. The Lord is with you. And when you think about every one of those stories, here's reality for us. They found favor with the Lord. They were blessed and guided by the Lord. Some great things were going to happen with those individuals, right? But if you start reading past that story in the next couple of verses or chapters, you realize like, oh my gosh, it gets crazy for them, right? So it's not a promise that everything's going to be wonderful and perfect and peaceful and you'll never have a hardship again. But it's about God is like, I want to bless you. I want to give favor upon you. I want to point you in the right direction. This doesn't guarantee anything like health. I know that firsthand. It doesn't promise prosperity. We see that scripturally. Watch what we say here. So let's go back to Jeremiah. And again, I'm flipping all over. I do apologize. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1. You are always righteous, O Lord, when you bring a case before me, yet I would speak with you about your injustice. Jeremiah is like, I don't even understand the Lord. I don't understand what's going on. I'm seeking you. All these Christians are seeking you. And all this other stuff is happening. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Question mark. That's a good question to ask the Lord. Why do all the faithless live what I see as ease? Because if it was true, if you think about that, if prosperity and health was the uh, symbol or the evidence that we have the favor of the Lord, it wouldn't look like today, would it? It wouldn't look like my neighbor super successful and is doing well in life and is, is prospering and his health is better than my health and all these kind of things. And then all the Christians, well, Christians, you know, they're all prospering. they got mansions and toys and health and all that kind of stuff. Is that true? It's not, is it? And so we see clearly here, it doesn't guarantee anything like that. It guarantees your eternal destination. That's what it guarantees for sure. But in between your salvation and eternity, it doesn't guarantee that. I would love that. I would love to preach that. You know, you are going to be prosperous financially. Your wallet wallet just grows overnight, you know. Your health, like, ho, ho, you're just like, you know, huge, awesome. You know, you can just, you know, like, it doesn't guarantee that. What it guarantees, though, is that whatever you face, he'll be there with you. There is nothing that you can face that he hasn't already overcome. There is nothing that you can't turn to him that he'll guide you and give you peace in. That's what he guarantees. Go back to Psalm 37, uh, verse 7. Be still before the Lord and do what? Hurry up. What are you waiting for, Lord? Quit messing around. I got the clock's ticking. Wait patiently. I don't want to read that scripture. That's that's unbiblical. Let's take that page out of the word of God, right? Don't fret when men succeed in their ways. When they carry out their wicked schemes. Don't fret over those things. Because this is material, earthly things that they're being successful with. That are going to burn. But our reward is somewhere else. It's safe and secure. Where silly mothballs can't get to you. So we have a security. And no one can take that from us. No amount of unsuccessfulness or our health or all those kind of things can affect or change that. Isn't that just a wonderful thought? It's secure because it's with Christ. So will we ever suffer difficulties? And I think we, could, we know that scripturally. But let's just look at a couple verses so we kind of are reminded, unfortunately, of that. Isn't that just terrible? 
2 Corinthians 6, 4. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance. That's a good thing to do. Uh, in troubles. We don't want that. Hardships. No, oh, thank you. And distresses. Ouch. You know, those are the kind of lists we don't want to. We don't want to accept. Uh, Paul goes on to say when he's teaching, uh, when the church is planted in Acts chapter 14, 22, Paul is saying, strengthening the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith. Well, we should do that. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. <laughs> what? Paul, no, no. You go back to your old ways. That's, that's, you know, you go back to your old teaching. We would see Peter as well in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. I don't know how much suffering you've gone that's been unjust. Where something has happened, where you're like, you know, if, if you do something, like, you know, if you go out and steal or murder or something, then there's, there's suffering, there, there's consequence. I get that. But if you're trying to live a godly life and things that are happening to you unjustly, that's unfair. Why would that happen to me? I love Jesus. You know, those things kind of shouldn't happen to me. But they do, don't they? And again, it would be unscripturally to say, like, oh, none of that would ever happen to you ever again. And then you go out and live your life, and you say, well, I, I, I don't understand this, Lord. Like, your word says this, but I, you know, live like that. No, because it's biblical that these things will happen. There will be challenges, so you've got to be ready for them. Those who are favored of God know that God is, again, with them. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things, everything, unjust things, good things, health problems, prosperity, not prosperity, you know, bankruptcy, whatever it looks like, God is going to use every situation to help mold and shape us, whether we want to allow it or not. We can, like, walk at it and, like, get frustrated with it, or we can receive it with open arms. I'm getting treated unjustly. Praise the Lord. I just lost out on a deal. I didn't like, I lost lots of money. Oh, praise God, he's got it under control. I am so glad that he decided to do that. Because he could trust me with it. Because he knew that I would overcome it. And that I would be an example for others because of what I went through. Isn't that just a shift in your mindset? We know that uh, our struggle to remain true to him, I will not go unrewarded. And that's what we're talking about. A reward that cannot be shifted in any way. Uh, Revelations 2, uh, chap, uh, 2, chapter 2, verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Thank you, Lord. I don't need to be afraid of that. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison and test you. You will suffer persecution for 10 years. Now be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. We don't have to worry. The enemy will try and do things, but he is a defeated enemy. He's already lost. You already have victory. You're already a winner in God's eyes. And so we don't have to worry about what we'll say, how we'll respond. We just look to him for our response. We look to him for guidance, and he will guide your ways. Without faith, though, it's really impossible to do that. It's really impossible to follow through with that. We would see in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Again, it's not about a bunch of works. If we do this, we'll get that. But that which is through faith. If I have faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God is by faith. So how do we get the favor of the Lord? It's to have faith. It's to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to believe upon his word. It's about putting off our external problems and saying, put my eyes upon heavenly promises that God has for us. We can see that so clearly here. And just the last couple of verses here. Put our faith in the Lord Jesus. Proverbs 8, 35, it says, For whoever finds me finds life and... Oh, I love the and part. I need the icing and the cherries and the, you know, all that kind of flavoring. And receives the favor of the Lord. Whoever finds me, not hard to find God, finds true life, finds real life, and receives the favor of the Lord as we live on this planet. Psalm 5, verse 12. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor 
as with a shield. As the enemy comes and looks to try and devour and kill and steal and destroy, you found the favor and the protection of the Lord. Don't we pray that often for ourselves? I pray that for the church. You pray that for your kids. God, protect them on all sides, you know, top, bottom, left, right, all those kind of areas, uh, with you, with your spirit, so the Holy Spirit's coming out of them, they will protect it so the darkness won't come in. And how do we receive that? We see scripturally here, as we pursue God, he will surround us with his favor. He will protect us. Again, understanding this isn't about gaining more love from the Lord. This isn't about gaining a higher you know, reward into heaven. It's about living today and about having victory today. It's about living victoriously with Christ Jesus. It's about being free in your mind. It's about having all of your worries and anxieties lifted from you in Jesus' name. That's the kind of favor that God wants to bestow upon you. So we go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 55, where this all started. This whole uh, train of thought came from. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and he grew in the favor of the Lord. I want to be a person, and I think we're a church, and I look out here, I know many of you are doing that. And you sense that, don't you? I know throughout this week, something's happening. You say, oh, God, I needed you to meet with me. And God met with you, and he helped you through whatever you were going through. So let's continue to seek him, to serve him, to be strengthened by him, to walk in his ways, and God will take care of you. We love you as a church. We want to help you. We want to take care of you. We want to guide you. But you have to leave here at some point soon. I, I, I come over to your house, but there's only one of me. I'd love to just walk with you all week and hang out with you. But you have to go. And the beautiful thing is that you're not alone because the Holy Spirit is going with you. And the Holy Spirit will help guide you and lead you. So let's just bow our heads and just take a moment to pray together. God, we are so grateful for your word. As we read this morning, we say to, to tremble at the word of God. Tremble not in fear, but tremble in excitement and anticipation that you're going to do something. And you're going to speak to us and, and help us, Father. And so, Lord, I just envision, like, if we've been trying to drive the areas of our life, God, would we just get out of the driver's seat? We just give that to you, Father. We can't control the outcome. We don't know where it goes from here. We've tried everything. It's just not going the way we wanted it to. God, I just, I picture my health. God, my health is completely out of control. I, I, I can't fix it. Doctors don't have answers. I, I get out of the way, Lord. I just let you. You're the healer. You're the redeemer. You're everything I need. And for others here this morning, they're going through hard times. They've been facing difficulties this week. And Father, you've overcome that. You've given them everything they need to be uh, an overcomer in that area as well. Father, all the, the anxiety and the fear and the depression, all those kind of things that the enemy is trying to put on them, as we read today, as we pursue you like we pursued you this morning, you set up a shield around us. So those things are not welcome. And so we say in Jesus' name, you're not welcome here. Only the presence of God is welcome. Only the Holy Spirit is welcome. Only your purpose and your will be done this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.